America is addicted to oil, which is often imported from unstable parts of the world. Yes, we hear that America is addicted to oil. The president has said it. I know it came as a shock to some to hear a Texan stand up there in front of the country and say, we got a real problem. America is addicted to oil. But I meant it because it's a true fact and we've got to do something about it now. But it was in 1945 that the President of the United States, at that time Franklin Roosevelt, first grasped the nature of this crisis. We must be the great arsenal of democracy. For us, this is an emergency as serious as war itself. Franklin Roosevelt first looked ahead and saw that the United States eventually would become dependent. And he was the one who pioneered a foreign policy based on oil. I should like to see this nation geared up to the ability to turn out at least 50,000 planes a year. Roosevelt understood that oil was a decisive factor in America's victory in World War II. We triumphed over the Germans and Japanese, true by military prowess and the leadership of our generals, but also because the U.S. had a superior industrial capacity we were able to produce so many thousands of tanks and planes, and we had the petroleum to fuel those weapons, whereas the Germans and Japanese did not. But at the same time, Roosevelt understood that the United States would no longer be able to supply its forces with oil in the future because we were using up so much of our domestic reserves. And this is what worried Franklin Roosevelt most in the final months of World War II. And so he set out to find a foreign source of oil to make up for the decline in American reserves. One of the most colorful visits to the presidential cruiser was that of the ruler of Saudi Arabia, King Ibn Saud. The 65-year-old monarch leaves his country for the first time to attend this... You have to picture this extraordinary moment at the end of World War II. The fateful meeting on February 14, 1945, between the President of the United States, Franklin D. Roosevelt, and the King of Saudi Arabia, Abdelaziz Ibn Saud. On one hand, the leader of the free world, a passionate advocate of democracy and freedom, sitting next to an absolute monarch who was accompanied by slaves and astrologers and Bedouin bodyguards. No records were kept of this meeting. But all historians and American policymakers agree that the basis of the discussion was that henceforth the United States would provide the royal family with protection in return for an exclusive American right to develop Saudi Arabia's oil. And every American president since then has reaffirmed the U.S. alliance with Saudi Arabia. Our relations with Saudi Arabia have been long, close, and cordial. As the venerable Arabic saying has it, our house is your house. There's an Arab saying, the sands are blowing. And I submit to you, King Fahad, that if the sands of time give us any hint of the future, it is that in the days ahead, the friendship between the Saudi Arabian and American people will be a strong and vital force in the world. So even when American presidents speak about our deep commitment to the spread of democracy worldwide, and we rail against other countries, Iran or Sudan, 
Venezuela for their lack of democracy, we conspicuously ignore the total lack of democracy in Saudi Arabia year after year after year. There are questions about how good a friend Saudi Arabia has really been to the U.S. Experts and U.S. officials give the Saudis low marks, charging that they continue to export the ideology of terror. Human rights groups and Saudi dissidents also complain about the pace of reforms promised by King Abdullah and say Saudi Arabia remains among the worst countries in the Middle East when it comes to religious freedom and rights of women. But Saudi women still can't drive, can't vote, and can't work or get medical treatment without approval of a male relative. We have historically chosen to overlook the fact that the royal family is a feudal monarchy that grants no rights whatsoever to its population. And we have created a very elaborate military establishment in Saudi Arabia, providing some of the most sophisticated arms in the world, providing military training to the kingdom, military advisors of stationing troops in the kingdom. The modern Saudi military really is a creation of the United States. We've had military missions there for decades. And there can be no explanation for that other than the fact that the royal family guarantees our access to Saudi Arabian oil. In fact, when the United States sent troops to Saudi Arabia in 1990, after the Iraqi invasion of Kuwait, then Secretary of Defense Dick Cheney told the Senate Armed Services Committee that the reason the United States was coming to the rescue of Saudi Arabia was because of the agreement between Roosevelt and Abdelaziz. Our strategic interests uh, in the Persian Gulf region I think are well known but, but bear repeating today. Uh, we do of course have historic ties uh, especially to the Saudis but other governments in the region uh, that hark back with respect to Saudi Arabia to uh, 1945 when President Franklin Delano Roosevelt met uh, with uh, King Abdul Aziz on the USS Quincy towards the end of World War II and affirmed at that time that the United States had a lasting continuing interest in the security of the kingdom. And so this special relationship with Saudi Arabia has shaped American foreign policy since Roosevelt's day.